Hey everyone, it's Tiffany and Kyle and Michaela and we just finished our part two to this series so now we're going to continue on with Michaela's journey. We ended up getting back up to the room eventually and later on that afternoon um, our new neurologist doctor came in and they basically told us to sit down and I knew at that point something was like horribly wrong but I just didn't know what so they started explaining that Michaela had lysencephaly and I remember them asking me do we have any questions and it's like well yeah of course we do but how are we supposed to ask all these questions if we don't even know what this is so I don't even think we asked too many questions other than um, my mom asked um, was there anything that I could have done um, to cause this like because I drank once heavily um, when I was like early on in my pregnancy and I didn't know and um, also I went to Canada's Wonderland and went on roller coasters so my mom asked if any of this could cause her um, lysencephaly and the doctor said no absolutely not we ended up going home and um, by that point, later that night and the next morning, my dad had already researched lysencephaly on the internet. And he found out that there's actually three different types of lysencephaly and they hadn't told us which type she was. So um, my dad was actually seeing pictures of children with deformities and um, breathing tubes and feeding tubes and um, just things like that where nothing was adding up to Michaela's condition could because she was perfectly normal she she was beautiful she didn't have any breathing tubes or complications or things like that so we were very confused at that point so when we had our next appointment which I don't even think was that long from the MRI and now we had all these questions um, to ask the doctors so we asked what um, type she was and they said that she was classical lysencephaly which is type 1 that no she didn't need breathing tubes or feeding tubes um, like from birth but that she may need it eventually in the future we researched um, her actual type we found that no they can be very normal and sometimes they don't need feeding tubes or breathing tubes until later on in life and um, that they can end up, um, I guess, developing. Um, they may not as develop as a normal child would, but they sometimes have, um, like they can hold their head, or some can crawl, and some can maybe even communicate. Um, so we knew that at that point that it wasn't the worst thing for Michaela. Like it could have been worse, but I still had felt like why did it have to be us or mainly why did it have to be her so we just lived life as normally as we could and went day by day and Michaela actually the day we did the MRI she was started on um, an injection called ACTH where it would help control her seizures and that worked for about two months she didn't have any seizures and she started holding her head again which was great because we knew she had potential to learn and develop. It lasted for about two months and then I remember um, my uncle and his girlfriend were up and I had what's called an angel care monitor and if I can find a link for an angel care monitor I'll put it in the description but basically it's a baby monitor but it's a pad and you put it underneath the mattress for the baby and it detects their breathing like the movements of their breathing so I remember um, the monitor actually going off saying that Michaela wasn't breathing and I went in there and she was in a seizure which was really weird because she hadn't had any and then all of a sudden um, she was not breathing so I called 911 again and we were transferred to um, a hospital and then later on we were transferred to sick kids again and I remember they took her off ACTH right away, like they weaned her off pretty much right away. 
and she was started on uh, pill medication. After that, um, I guess things just kind of mellowed out. Like she was still having seizures every day and she could have up to, I guess, 10 or more seizures a day, but things were mellowing out. We were starting to understand um, what life was going to be like with the child with a disability because she had stopped developing. She wasn't doing the things that she had done before her seizures. Um, so we just kind of went with day-to-day -day life and she was having tests every now and then, um, like EEGs, the brainwave scans. She was referred to eye doctors and what else? Sick kid trips were regular? Yeah, sick kid trips were regular um, checkups and our pediatrician we saw every month. Yeah, um, physio? Physiotherapy, occupational, occupational therapy. therapy. We were eventually referred to um, speech, 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 speech therapy, eyes, um, eye therapy. Um, there was just all these things going on um, that we continually did. Um, there was actually she was about a year and a half, and we she was eating by mouth still. She was doing great with that. Um, she would have baby food and I would make like brown beans or mashed potatoes and things like that and she would eat amazingly so she was growing uh, as a normal baby she, had, she just wasn't developing so um, it was about a year and a half she was a year and a half and we were referred by sick kids to do a feeding study where they basically x-ray you while you eat and it shows where the food is going because she had always been really like raspy in her throat, like phlegmy. So, but she had had that from birth. So they really wanted to see um, if the food was going into her stomach. And I remember that day when we went, um, it was just about time for her lunch. And I had normally fed her like Kyle is holding her now on an angle. Um, and she ate really well. Well, when we went into the feeding study room, they sat her like straight up. And I said to them, like, that's not how she eats. Like, this isn't basically fair. And the nurse or the technician um, said, well, how do you feed her? Like, what do you give her first? And I said, well, you know, I usually give her this and then this and then she'll have a bottle afterwards because she was having uh, formula at that point. Yeah, she asked me what I did on a regular basis and she completely did the opposite. She gave her a bottle first and then like total opposite of her food and it was just like, this isn't right, like you're changing her whole routine, like this, you can't compare her routine to something totally different if you really want to see results. So um, I just remember her coming out and saying like, yes, she is aspirating, which is food going into her lungs. And I said, you can't do that. That's not fair. Like, I was actually feeding her in the hallway because she hadn't finished her food. And she was eating completely normal. Um, because in the feeding study room, she was coughing. She was choking. She was showing signs that she was not happy and something was wrong. So when I took her in the hall and she was eating normally, I showed the technician. And I said, look, like, this is totally different. So um, she basically shrugged it off and thought I was just a mom being stupid or didn't know what I was talking about or whatever. So we actually went up to, um, I guess, the meeting room to meet with our neurologist and the, t the feeding study technician. And I told them that I wasn't impressed with how it was done. It's not comparable to what she normally eats. And um, they basically said we could do, I believe, two options. Um, we could continue feeding her the way she was. Or we and could, risk pneumonia. Yeah, and risk pneumonia. Or we could start her on an NG tube, which is a feeding tube that goes through your nose into down your um, basically your throat and into your stomach. Um, we could start on that and then go from there. And I said, why would I do that when I know she's eating and growing and she's healthy? Like, there's no sense in starting an NG tube when I know she can eat. So I guess it was about, I guess, how many months later? It was December 5th, um, I was feeding Michaela and 
I was just feeding her as normal in the morning for her breakfast and I remember she had this very very dry cough and she had always had like a wet phlegmy cough um, so I knew that something was wrong there she had a dry cough she was very irritable um, she didn't sleep that night did she yeah she slept that night um, she was very irritable and she wouldn't like push down her food like she wouldn't keep it down she threw up for her morning feed and her lunch feed and I just knew that something was not right um, and her breathing was really fast paced I think so I guess it was after lunchtime and um, I knew that something was wrong because she had just thrown up her lunch and we were kind of talking about it thinking like oh maybe she does have pneumonia like something's not right um, so we ended up researching the symptoms for pneumonia and everything was matching up to the symptoms so I think it was about five o'clock and we took her to our local hospital and they did confirm that she had pneumonia from aspiration and I guess I should explain pneumonia um, pneumonia is when you have an infection inside your lungs um, and aspiration is food going into your lungs so the pneumonia was caused by food being in her lungs and um, she basically couldn't get it out of her lungs so the food stayed in there and um, the infection started and she couldn't basically heal herself so she was started on medication pretty much right away in our local hospital for pneumonia and then we were transferred um, I can't remember if it was that night or the day after but we were transferred to sick kids once again and we stayed there for about a week and a half um, until she was completely healed so when we first got to sick kids um, the first thing they did pretty much was they monitored her and uh, they inserted an NG tube the thing that I hated most I knew from that point on that she would never eat again um, so they basically kept giving her medications and things like that and I remember one night because um, my mom wasn't there yet and um, there all of a sudden something went wrong and I didn't know what was wrong and all of a sudden there was like 15 doctors in the room and nurses and all, all these things and I just didn't know what was going on and I was so scared and like it's one of those scenes you see in like a movie where the person is like standing back from their loved one and just watching the chaos go on and I was by myself and so I actually called my mom and dad and I said I don't know what's going on but you better get here quick so um, after things calmed down I was still on the phone with my mom and they like the nurses and uh, the doctors explained everything's okay just there was basically a hiccup in what was happening and not to worry so I told my mom at that point I still wanted her to come but she didn't have to rush so my mom ended up coming the next day and just spending um, about a week with me so we were having a good time in hospital we don't like to be so upset in hospital because we always see people that are um, so down and out and we didn't want to be those people so we actually had fun in the hospital um, we try and make the best of it because we were close to um, the big mall in Toronto so we would walk to the mall and go shopping because it was about Christmas time so we were buying Christmas stuff and we were yes beautiful is so we were trying to enjoy ourselves and um, about a few days before we were to leave we were being taught how to feed Michaela by NG tube she was started on a formula called Nutrin Junior and it has fiber in it and um, so she was only going to have formula from now on so we had to learn how to feed her um, formula and medications through her tube so um, we learned that as well um, we were booked a an appointment for a G tube which is a feeding tube just it goes through um, your stomach instead which needed surgery so we left there we were okay we went on with our 
um, our lives and I believe our appointment for the G-tube was booked in February and we were having a horrible time with the NG tube. It, can't, it, it was coming out all the time. It actually got to the point where it was coming out of her nose um, every two days and our local hospital couldn't insert it because um, they just didn't have the experience because it's just a small hospital. And me and my nurse, could, because we had a home care nurse coming in and she could get the NG tube in but we couldn't actually check the placement of it because it kept coming up wrong. We couldn't, you're supposed to hear like this popping sound in her stomach to know um, when it's there. So we couldn't hear that. So we actually were traveling to sick kids like every two days and we were there actually on Christmas Eve at, until three in the morning. And um, I just basically said to the doctor there, I said, if this comes out once more, because it came out probably what, five, times? Just a couple times, days before that. Like, it was coming out so often. So I said, I said to them, I said, if it comes out once more, I'm bringing Michaela here and we are staying here until she can have surgery. Because I cannot keep, like, traveling three hours just to have an NG tube put in. It wasn't fair to Michaela because she wouldn't be fed f for hours at a time because she couldn't be. And she couldn't have her medications with the, without the NG tube in and things like that. So um, I just said, you better get on us, get us an appointment. Otherwise, we're staying here if it comes out again. So we actually ended up getting a cancellation for January 26th, I believe. Um, so we traveled to SickKids um, the day before. And we stayed in a hotel just across the street. Um, so because her appointment was for 8 o'clock in the morning because she had to be sedated and things like that so it was about 12 o'clock I think by the time she went in for her surgery and she came back out later that afternoon because she had to wake up and they had to monitor her and things like that and when we went back up to her room um, she had a like a patch on her stomach and then the g-tube came out of the patch so um, the nurse was actually showing us how to clean and um, I guess redo the dressing for dressing is basically the um, what's it called tape patch so uh, we were doing that and because we were already used to the NG tube um, we didn't have to learn anything basically for the G tube so that was kind of nice. We just went on our way with that. We left the hospital and we were feeling very comfortable um, with the G-tube as well. Um, her seizures weren't as bad and now it's been about a year and a half um, since then and we're very comfortable with the G-tube. Uh, her seizures have mellowed out. She's only having, I guess, anywhere from one to three a day. Um, and she hasn't really developed, she can't hold her head still, um, she can't roll, she can't crawl, she um, can't talk, but she does communicate in a way that usually a baby does. So she can let you know when she's, um, I guess, upset or happy or... Um, Tired, cranky. Yeah, just all the different emotions. So she can tell us, like how she is feeling basically but sometimes we may, may not know what's wrong but we are comfortable with where she is today we are happy um, with her growth and even though she can't walk or talk she still has a <laughs> a cheeky personality because that's her her nickname is cheeky and um, we're just very happy with where we are um, we know um, there may not be a specific reason that she is the way she is but we want to try and uh, make a difference in someone's life and hopefully um, have something good come out of this so we hope that you enjoyed our story this is part two I'll have part one in the description below if you haven't seen that already and I hope you enjoyed watching this I hope you come along uh, for our journey because I will have a uh, new series coming up so far um, soon and I think that's pretty much all we have to say so far I hope you enjoyed this video thank you so much for wa watching like and subscribe for more videos bye guys